I was born in the early 90s, and in the United States that meant a revolution of toys and, well, electronic devices, especially around the Christmas season. Although there was one thing that outlasted the Christmas season, uh, not much of a novelty or gimmick, at least for me, like every red-blooded American boy, Lionel trains caught my eye, and I certainly couldn't keep them off. The big O-gauge trains were more of what they called a rich man's hobby, and for the most part, my parents didn't want to buy me such an expensive gift when, in reality, I was a little child. Not only was it expensive and hard on the family finances, but also, a little kid couldn't really take care of that kind of stuff. But my grandfather had this wonderful train layout in his basement, so whenever we'd go over there, they figured, well, I could get my fix there. That wasn't enough, and me and my brother continued to ask, and eventually, our other grandfather bought us a K-Line train set. I still have that set to this day. This began a lifelong fascination with model railroading. This brings us to today. Last year, I decided to set up a Christmas display with my wife, and it turned out pretty well, at least I thought so. Here's what it looked like. Let's put ourselves in the shoes of a child in 1960 on Christmas morning. They open up their present and they see they got a Lionel 154. They're all excited, they hook it up, they turn on the power, and they get this. It doesn't flash! Now I wouldn't put it past Lionel, they also told you that you could own missiles on your <laughs> Lionel train set. Real live missiles! Just like the ones on the Lionel missile firing car you can own. But indeed, in this case, it doesn't flash. There's three posts. One goes to ground, and the other two to the respective bulbs. Essentially what you have are a couple of light bulbs that light up. Lionel wasn't the only one doing this either. The Marks Toy Company also made a similar flasher as you see here, and it's the same thing. One ground, two posts. I think we can do better than that. So it's time to dust off the old electrical engineering degree and solve a problem many smarter people before me have solved in the past. Make a flashing circuit for all these O-scale crossings. I'm going to be honest, the biggest reason I wanted to do this, I think, was because I wanted to prove to myself I could still do analog circuit design after hanging my electrical engineering degree up for a few years. And eventually, I solved it. Here's what it looks like. It's pretty darn close to what you could expect a grade crossing to flash at. One second period, 50% on, 50% off. But it isn't perfect, and there's a lot of gaps in my knowledge, and you'll see that. But nonetheless, let's get started. There are a few guiding principles I used for this design. The first thing, I wanted to keep it cost effective. So this means that I wanted to keep the overall cost of the 154 and the circuit below, far below, what a modern 154 that does the flashing would cost. Because otherwise, what's the point? The second thing I was going to do was all discrete components. Only resistors, capacitors, inductors, transistors, things like that. No microcontrollers. I mean, I really could just use the MOSFET or two and a microcontroller, and that would probably be cheaper. But in the spirit of Lionel trains, let's keep things big and old. And finally, the third one was to have fun. I wanted to really enjoy this. And I certainly did. So let's dive right in. In order to effectively control an electrical signal, one must understand all the properties of it first. With O-scale trains, it uses something called AC, or alternating current, and this becomes a problem. What ends up happening is there's a negative component to the amplitude, meaning that even if we're at 22 volts, the peak-to-peak -peak is 44, as you can see on the scope. This means that complex numbers start getting involved with the math, and controlling things using traditional components, like RCL components, doesn't really work. There's transient analysis you can do, but you want to just be able to turn signals on and off. So this means we need DC. Now, DC can be converted from AC in a number of ways, but the simplest and cheapest solution for me was to use what's called a half-wave rectifier. And essentially what that does is it filters out negative component of the AC. But even at that point, you're still left with what looks like a shark tooth waveform. So the best way to curb this is to add a giant capacitor. If you can increase the capacitive constant, you can essentially stretch out what's called the ripple voltage, meaning whatever's left over from the half-wave rectifier, to a point where it's almost unnoticeable. This half-wave rectifier is achieved by taking a 10,000 mic capacitor and taking its anode and connecting it with the cathode of the rectifier diode with a high forwarding current. If the anode of the diode is set to positive, 
and then the cathode is set to ground on the capacitor, you will have a half wave rectifier that produces something like this. And as you can see here, the ripple voltage isn't very high, and it's acceptable enough for our cases, so I'm cool with that. Now that we have somewhat of a DC waveform in order to be able to turn signals high and low, let's start thinking about techniques for actually generating this. One of the bulbs needs to be high for a half second, at the same time the other one needs to be low for a half second. And then after that time period has lapsed, they need to flip. And this needs to continue indefinitely. I thought back to my IC design class in university and remembered this one concept, known as a multivibrator. Now there are many kinds, but today we're going to talk about the A-stable kind, meaning that there's no stable state. So it oscillates, exactly what we need. The A-stable multivibrator is used for things like clock generators and things of that sort where indefinite square waveform generation is needed. And in our case, we need that exact same thing. We just need to apply it to our bulbs, and we need to make sure they're opposite at each time. So in order to complete the switching circuit, one of the designs of an A-stable multivibrator is as follows. There's two BJTs. These two BJTs are cross-coupled with one another. The base of one is connected through by a capacitor and resistive network to the collector of another. And through this, we're able to effectively control things back and forth. But here's the confusing thing about this circuit. When power is applied, both capacitors should charge at the same exact time for the first time. This means that they should both charge to the state where both of them should be on and off at the same time. But due to differences in tolerances of components, Luckily, it's able to ping pong off itself till it eventually reaches this A-stable state where one goes on and the other goes off. At this point, we can assume that Q1 is allowing the base current to flow. Once this happens, Q1 is switched on and is in saturation. Current flows through from the collector to the emitter, meaning that in this path we put our bulb and the bulb is on. This eventually discharges C1 and Q2 remains switched off. However, as the collector current starts to flow through C1, the base voltage for Q2 goes up. And the reason this happens is because the capacitor of C1 starts to charge that base voltage until it hits saturation. Once that occurs, now Q2 is switched on and Q1 is flipped off. This will alternate back and forth indefinitely and will eventually settle on whatever your RC constant of the circuit is. So this means if we can effectively choose these component values correctly, we can get that exact same time waveform we're looking for. This design does have some inherent issues though. For example, if you take a look at the waveform, clearly there's a curved edge on the rise time. And that can potentially ruin your output depending on what your values are. The reason this happens is the nature of the capacitor. The capacitor when voltage on one plate or one portion of the capacitor changes rapidly, the other plate also goes a similar rapid change. The right hand plate of C2 will fall rapidly from the supply voltage to almost zero and then the left hand plate will also fall in voltage by a similar amount. Really what this means is that you'll get this curved edge on the rise time and this is seen, I'll show in the scope shots later, and also the simulation. If I cared a little bit more about the rise time being a little bit more crisp, I could have added a couple of diodes and a few resistors in between the capacitor network. This would have improved the rise time. But for this circuit, this is totally fine. Here's a slow motion capture of the final result. You notice that even though one of the bulbs should be completely off, it's actually on a little bit. But the other one is much brighter, so the appearance is totally fine. It still seems like it's flashing on and off. So this is totally acceptable for our design. Instead of doing calculations by hand to figure out the capacitor and resistive network that I needed along with these BJTs, I just decided to use a simulator known as LT Spice because it was faster. <laughs> and I'm a bit of a savage, I suppose. But here's what I ended up finding. What I did is essentially I chose pi big power transistors to deal with the large current draw that O scale typically has. Remember, these are incandescent bulbs, and essentially the way that they light up is just heating filament, meaning they need a lot of current to be drawn into them. So I need resistors that are not only extremely robust, but can be switched on at a slower frequency. So I decided to pick a few old TIP 3055s from ST, and these are used in switching power supplies. So they're more than ro enough robust from what I need, and they're cheap enough to the point where it fits in the budget. And as you can see, the switching properties are perfect for this. However, we still do see in the simulation on the outputs the same effect that we were talking about, the curved rise times on both sides. But this is totally okay.
Now looking at this circuit, there's a few things I can find that could potentially be a problem and we have to be careful about. If we look at R1 and R4, the differences in values of resistance from R3 and R2 are pretty large and they're on the lower side, meaning that current is going to want to naturally flow to those areas. And this is where our outputs are, the bulbs. That's where we want them to go. But this also means that R1 and R4 are going to dissipate a ton more power than R3 and R2. So this means that we need a higher rating of power for these resistors. In this case, I calculated about 3 watts should be good. But the problem is, is these things are always going to be dissipating a lot of power. So this means that not only do we need to make sure that these values are correct, but those values are also probably going to be fluid, meaning there's going to be some heat damage over time. So my philosophy here, and this is crazy, but my philosophy here was to try a few different values on a breadboard to see eventually where this stabilized over a few iterations of this. And eventually I settled on 150 ohm 3 watt resistors, but in reality, eventually after the heat got to them for a little bit, their values kind of stabilized right around 80 ohms. And this is what you see here in the simulation, and it ends up being quite nice. So after I officially put the circuit together and started testing, I decided to throw it on the scope. And the scope shows almost exactly what we expected from not only the theory, but also the simulation. We still see the curved rise times due to the capacitors charging very rapidly, but we also see the fall time extremely crisp, meaning that the rise time might show a little bit more light on the other one, but overall it should be okay. Let's double check our period to make sure that it's good. And as you can see on the scope here, it's right around one full second with the duty cycle around 33%, but that's not really accurate. And let me explain why. So the curved rise time means that that capacitor charges up and logical one is when the duty cycle calculation on that scope turns on. This means that if it were a crisp waveform, it would probably be about 50%. Since it's at 33%, this means it's probably when it hits about halfway up on a logical one scale from the voltage. So really it shows 33, but it's really about 50%. Both on time and off time, at least to the appearance of the naked eye, are about even. So this is a fair measure. So I think we can effectively call this a solution. Is it a good solution? <laughs> I don't know about that, but hey, it works. And it does what we need it to. For those who are interested in building this themselves, they can reference the schematic diagram in the previous part of the video, and I'll also provide a bill of materials for the circuit on screen here, and also in the description of the video, so you can try it out yourself. I ended up soldering up a bunch of perf boards together in order to make this easier to put on my layouts. If there's one thing I've learned from this whole experience is that I love learning, and even if it's relearning things that I learned years ago, it's a lot of fun to solve a problem with a lot of the tools you've amassed along the way, but also realizing that sometimes rehashing old stuff can also bring back a lot of joy, and you realize that you forgot some things and you can relearn. But I've also learned that I have a newfound respect for people who do analog circuit design all the time. There's a lot of nitty gritty details that you don't really get in my area of work and more in embedded software. There's a lot of details there too, but in a different way. Either way, I hope you enjoyed my journey through this video. This was my Christmas story, and I appreciate you stopping by. Oh yeah, and I forgot to mention, I delivered on the price tag idea. The circuit bomb was roughly about $6, and the Lionel 154 is about $15. So $21 versus, let's say, $50 to $60 for one that does the flashing for you, I'd say that's a cost-effective solution. Thanks for following me on my Christmas story journey, and this is James from Zygo Studios, signing off.